So it looks like people are signing in. We have rural Telqua in Northwest British Columbia. That's a pretty good piece. We have Sarah from upstate New York, Grace from Philadelphia suburbs, Kathy from Ontario. They're having a beautiful fall too this year. And then Beth from Claremont, Nancy from Long Island. Oh, no colors, Nancy, too bad. Bradenton, Florida, you probably don't have a lot either there. How about Oaxaca? Oh, very good. She's going to stay hidden, but we know she's from Oaxaca. Kate okay, from San Francisco. Sarah, Providence. Ah, Totsi and Wynn in Ecuador. All right, Totsi. She's, she's getting close to matching Kathmandu. She's the closest. We have Simone from London. Okay. I think we've got a, um, almost 70 people on board. Kelsey, do you want to get started? Absolutely. Thank you, Judy. Um, first, I want to say welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us and sharing part of your Saturday with us. Uh, before we begin the panel discussion, I'm going to just briefly share WARP's website. Um, for those of you who are um, not familiar with WARP, we are an international textile networking organization, Weave a Real Peace. And if you'd like to learn more, of us, more about us, our website is weavarealpeace.org. Uh, I wanted to share that if you visit the website, this first tab here, the events tab, you can view all of our other upcoming events. We have uh, programs every month, both open, um, free and open to all like this one. And we also have members only programs on Zoom. And if you've missed previous events and would like to watch them, we record all of our panel discussions and they can all be found here under previous events. So we invite you to visit the website and utilize those resources of the recorded programs. Um, I also want to share that under community, we have several resources. The one that I want to discuss today is the Artisan Direct Connect. And this is a, a guide, a listing of all of the WARP members who have textile related businesses. So it's a wonderful resource. And if you're a WARP member who does not have a listing, please feel free to reach out to us. I'll put my email address into the chat and we would love to include your organization here if you're not, not already listed. Um, and then lastly, if you are interested in a WARP membership, you can um, take a look at this membership tab and there's a join WARP there under that. So. Um, again, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce this month's panel discussion. So today we have the team of Around the World in 80 Fabrics. And Around the World in 80 Fabrics is an educational nonprofit that weaves people and fibers together for the planet. Through the documentation of responsibly and ethically made textiles, Around the World in 80 Fabrics raises awareness of the environmental, climate, human rights, and overall health impacts of our petroleum-based fast fashion wardrobes. They're doing wonderful work and a number of really interesting projects. And so today we'll hear about Around the World in 80 Fabrics from <laughs> co-founders, Dr. Tierney Teese and Carol Dunham and Outreach Director Leslie Robinson. So thank you all for joining us today. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tierney Teese for the introduction. Oh, thank you, Kelsey. It's just such an honor to be with you all today. I'm so excited. I'm a big fan of Warp and um, what you do. And it's, it's, you know, such important work. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I think I'll just pop it, I'll share slides right now. And we'll just get started as to where this project came from. Um, okay, let's see. Can you all see my, is that working? It looks, looks great. great. It, okay, yes. So, so I'm, I'm excited here with my, the, our wonderful, the three musketeers, our team of, of um, Leslie and Carol, and I'll, and I'll just introduce where the project came from and then hand it over to them. So, um, years ago well i'm a career marine biologist 
And so I've spent many, many hours and years studying the marine environment and in marine conservation and seeing just more and more of my study sites filling up with plastic and my study animals as well. Oops. And the realization that my own wardrobe contained plastics that were getting into the ocean was a really jarring epiphany. And that really brought me into this whole world of textiles. I was mentoring a, a middle school team that was doing a competition for National Geographic about tackling plastics. And together we decided to make a teaching quilt of non-petroleum fabric alternatives. And that just brought me down the wormhole. So after realizing that I had an oil spill in my closet, um, and the more you look at it, you know, 60% of our clothing is actually petroleum based. And that's contributing. The fashion industry is a very polluting industry. It's contributing 8% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And when you look at what it's doing to the ocean, 35% of the ocean's microplastics are coming from our clothing. When we wash it, we shed all these tiny little fibers and actually three times more come out of our dryers than our washers. And these little tiny microfibers get into they get into everything. They get into our salt. They get into our beer, which is really sacrilegious. They get into the poop of our babies. There, a, a study just came out that they found these tiny microfibers in breast milk. Um, they are insidious and ubiquitous. And they're not just inert pieces of plastic. They actually carry with them. They soak up a bunch of persistent organic pollutants like DDTs, PCBs, PFASs, phthalates, a whole host of, of, um, of nasty chemicals. And an estimate, a, a study came out, the University of Newcastle estimating that we will eat, each of us, an estimated 40 pounds of plastic over the course of our lifetime. So this is, this is um, not by choice. This is something that's just happening to us. Um, and, and it's not slowing down the plastic production industry sees the writing on the wall it's come it's the oil and gas industry and they see the writing on the wall when it comes to the switch to renewables so they're pouring their efforts into plastic production to make up um, what they're losing to renewables and it's not slowing down so that is what put me on this odyssey and um and as i started to unravel what was in my closet it became more and more um, it, I became more entangled in the problems with with what we choose to wrap our hearts and our parts in. Um, you know, when we dye things, the dyeing industry is responsible for 20% of our wastewater pollutants and worker conditions um, for the fast fashion industry. Most, most garment workers in developing countries don't earn a living wage. So, you tie all this up together and it makes you really rethink your closet um, and think, what did we used to wear before there was all this oil spill in our closets? <laughs> you know, we used to have this wonderful coat of fur. We used to, you know, not have to worry about what our clothes were made of. But, you know, eventually we, we lost the fur. I like to call it our personal hair suit. And um, we had to but we, we, we've come up with such ingenious ways to, to clothe our naked bodies over the years. We've come up with, um, oh, and that's what, that's what's put me on. That's what put me on this wonderful odyssey with my, my wonderful friends, Carol and, and Leslie. Um, we've come up with, with hemp and, and cotton that date back 8,000 years. And we've come up with flax and silk dating back 5,000 years. So there's so many natural alternatives um, to what we clothe ourselves in now. It wasn't really until the 1950s that fashion oozed, um, that petroleum oozed into fashion. So with Around the World in 80 Fabrics, and um, <clears throat> I, I'm so excited to, uh, as I got into this world, one of my fellow National Geographic explorers, Carol Dunham, um, I found a kindred spirit in Carol and we joined forces. And as we started to, to collect fabrics around the world, we met the amazing, remarkable Leslie Robertson and the three of us have formed this team. And it has been such an exciting odyssey. We call it our mental health project. 
because the makers were meeting people like you, people like everyone here tuned into Warp. You guys are just such beacons of hope because the by connecting to the natural world and working with the raw materials that in many cases have been um, cultures have been working with these raw materials for hundreds and hundreds of years with deep connections to ecosystems and ecosystem health. Um, it's a win-win when we re-embrace these, these traditions. So we've been meeting all manner of incredible makers and all manner of amazing raw materials that we have used through the ages that can regenerate the soil, can clean the atmosphere, you know, be beneficial to our, to our, um, our habitats and to our cultures. So that's been just so exciting. And I will hand it over now to Leslie to go into a little bit more detail about some of our makers and some of our, our raw materials. Leslie, I think you're on mute. Okay. I'm on mute, of course. Carol, do you wanna go ahead and jump on? Oh, I'm sorry. To oh, no, no, we're, we're, yeah, that's okay. I'm sorry, Stand it over to Carol. Let's see here. Okay, trying to share my screen. Can you guys see my screen yet? Anybody see my screen? It says share, open share preferences. Hmm. Can you guys yeah, see my see screen? Your screen? We see. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Can't see. Oh, I don't see it. No, you're not sharing it, Carol. No. Oh, okay. How about now? Can you see it now? No. You have. You no, have to no. do full full screen. Click full screen. Okay. All right. I'm just going to try one second and move it. Just one second of patience here. When I try it, it just says desktop one. Keynote. There we go. Let's try this. Okay. How about now? Can you guys see it now? No. No. Okay. All righty. Well, I'm just going to share. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes. I'm really sorry. I would love to share my screen at another time with you all. Um, I, I just want to I just want to quickly share um, my enthusiasm before I pass it over to uh, Leslie. Um, I really wanted to just share a little bit of when we ask the question, you know, why clothes and where do clothes come from? And it's amazing as an anthropologist, because believe it or not, when we look at the history of fabrics, um, it's actually lice that give us a, cl a clue as to when we humans were first originally wearing fabrics. And um, and when we when we find that we we find that we when it's the evolution of life that help us to understand when we humans first probably were wearing um, clothes that weren't made from animal skins, and when we look at the current issues of extinction of animals on this planet today, many of you may have seen almost seventy percent of um, animals that have gone extinct even just since 1970. Uh, the, the need to try to look for diversity of possibilities of what we humans could wear in our future. What could we wear in a post petroleum future? Um, when we look back and we see like the very word fiber comes from tendon, um, which shows it's a link to ancient animal fibers. Uh, we then look and we see, you know, plant fibers and we love to call them the big five, of course, which many of you great textile experts already know cotton, hemp, linen, linen. Can we believe we found our first earliest fragments of linen 35,000 years ago in a cave in Georgia in imprints. And to think that we're still spinning linen because it still makes so much sense. And we have been finding incredible makers such as uh, uh, linen uh, makers in Ireland who are reviving linen because as it brings back whole entire ecosystems, there's hemp, uh, there's silk. When we realize that there's almost over 500 different species of wild silk out there, as we've been exploring the planet, finding wild silks in Namibia, in Madagascar, 
the diversity is, is extraordinary and it's extraordinarily exciting when we look at this ancient heritage. Um, I find it quite extraordinary as many of you may be aware, I have this beautiful big image of, of a lice, it really, really large if you can imagine, because it, it's pretty extraordinary when we realize, we think that the very father of microbiology, Antony Van Leeuwenhoek, who is the father of microbiology, and he was looking down and, you know, and finding, looking at microbes. And in fact, when we think that our very bodies are made of microbes, in fact, there's probably about 5 million trillion trillion microbes uh, on this planet. And that perhaps our future may be uh, in, in when we look, think of textiles in microbes. Um, so when we start to look beyond the classic big five of wool, linen, hemp, silk, and cotton, and we scour the world and look at different diversity of it all throughout the planet. Um, we also, and we're looking at you know things like jute. Uh, we're looking at agave that's made in in. Um, uh, we we were just down recently in Mexico, and we've been finding it's really exciting how people are trying to make. Um, for example, use agricultural waste and substitutes. And we're finding calotropis and then adding it, which is a weed that's like milkweed, a, a little a weed that grows on the roadsides. And now in India uh, with Wigan wool, we found a small company and they're adding it into the cotton to try to reduce the amount of cotton. Because as many of you may know, organic cotton, um, is, they, it, India actually uh, theoretically exports more organic cotton than it actually actually produces a real issue of problems of certification in this world as we try to figure out what will we wear um, and how can we do it sustainably. We have a lot of uncommon fibers that we really love. And I don't know if any of you are familiar, for example, with lotus. I have some beautiful images that I can't share with you right now, but they're it's extraordinary when you look from Myanmar to Cambodia to Laos to Vietnam, where actually they're using the stock of the lotus and they're actually out making fiber and able to make textiles out of it. People are being creative. They're even using human hair right now. Um, we have some wonderful Shen Gora, and many of you may be familiar that actually the Salish peoples in the Northwest coast used to have a special island off of Vancouver where they had special white dogs before white people came in and brought in their wool blankets that replaced the incredible wool of the of the of the dogs and there are people that are revitalizing and gathering the wool from their their dogs and spinning it there's things like banana fibers. Um, it, it's extraordinary. We love looking at pineapple fibers, piña, there in, um, in, in the Philippines, to bashofu in, in Japan, um, you find in Okinawa. And um, for myself as an anthropologist, I don't know if any of you have been up in Alaska, where you can see at the Alaskan Museum the most extraordinary parkas that the Inuit would, would make from walrus intestines that would uh, uh, help to protect against uh, the extreme weathers. And then of course, there's byssus silk that comes from a mollusk um, in, in Sardinia. Uh, from ancient times, there are people that are sustaining and maintaining this to the beautiful work of beetle wings that there that is kept alive in Thailand, where they use as decorative arts. Um, as myself, I have lived with nomads in Mongolia for over 20 years um, with the yak and camel herders. And then we have wonderful people like Elaine Moses with the muskox up in um, in Alaska, which is one of the finest microfibers uh, that is extremely, has extremely warm. Uh, I had a beautiful picture of Tierney uh, with a good friend of ours, uh, Saiful Islam in Bangladesh. And many of you, know, we think of muslin, and I don't know about you, I think of it as a sort of rough or coarse material that we put over jam jars. But in fact, uh, Napoleon's um, uh, uh, Bonaparte's uh, uh, Josephine used to wear it. It was a fine thin. We have in the Victoria Albert Museum the fine muslin that was over was two thousand threads per square inch 
we can't do that anymore. In fact, we and in fact, uh, he's been trying to revive this, and he has up now up to 500 per square inch. We have extraordinary cultural revitalizers like Mary Wiecki of the Santa Ana Pueblo, who's reviving turkey feather and yucca blankets as her ancestors used to make. And we have uh, in Siberia, uh, or we have in Alaska, Marlene Nelson, they're working with fish skins, working on using that for leather. Um, uh, in Oaxaca, I hear we have someone from Oaxaca here, um, the extraordinary uh, traditions of using traditional cayuchi silk excuse me, Cayuchi cotton. Um, there are also uh, early silks that are used there. And um, uh, we followed um, uh, uh, Moro Habakuk, who's uh, one of the last of this purple snail milkers as he would milk a purple snail that has ha actually helped to um, maintain, they've created a whole national park around this one little mollusk that creates this extraordinary purple dye called Tixlinda uh, that the Mixteca people uh, um, uh, make and continues in this vibrant, vibrant, brilliant purples. And then we have biofabrication, and I'm almost over to, to, to you, to, uh, to, to you, Leslie. But um, it's so exciting in the worlds of biofabrication now, as what cutting edge scientists are making in the laboratories. We just got a brand new little sample in um, from Polybion, where they're actually taking collagen um, and and they're in the laboratory creating, just like we have fake uh, milk uh, and meat, we can also make actually faux leather that is not made. Look, look, Tierney's showing it to us. That is not made, you know, the worst thing. Can you imagine vegan leather is actually polyester. That's some of that horrible ooze we have in our closets that we want to get rid of. So, um, I, you know, from orange waste to food waste to mycelium um, to algae, um, it's an exciting, very exciting, brave new world. I, I just to imagine what we can could be wearing uh, in the very near future. Um, we're working with um, a silk lab out of Tufts, uh, Tufts, and we're trying to create a library of all the different fibers on this very planet um, before and then telling the natural history of the extraordinary fibers. I really wish I could show you my extraordinary visuals because I've just come from Bhutan and we're working on a project on green textiles there as they're very excited about creating new dyes and how they can source sustainably um, the origins from wild silks to cottons that we have in that region. And on that, um, we're also trying to work, for example, if anyone uh, has been to ever been to the Himalayas and you see those beautiful prayer flags, well, there's a problem. They're all being made in China and they're all being made of polyester. So there's a new project to make them out of cotton. And we're working on right now on how we can use natural dyes uh, to make prayer flags uh, that are good for the environment. We're also really excited about recycling and upcycling. How can we take um, old clothes and, and, and make them into things that are new and exciting? And what about the waste that goes on in this planet? Um, we have a, our, a spectacular project uh, out of Guatemala uh, where, they, where they're taking all those terrible t-shirts and all our waste products, that, that our clothes that, that end up, we think, in our secondhand clothes and then gets packed up as waste, sent to the developing world, and um, uh, we actually made uh, a beautiful um, uh, uh, rug out of it. And uh, we're just so excited uh, with what all of you at Warp and Weft who care about clothing and what we can do uh, to really, to be able to think about what we're wearing and its impact on the environment. And on that, I want to hand this over to dear Leslie, who's gonna really share a lot more about one of our projects that we did at the Smithsonian, and I know she'll have a better chance at, cha at sharing her slides than I am all the way here in Kathmandu. Carol, you, you're Liz. always so passionate. So I think all of us, you paint pictures with your words. So I, you know, we'll try to get those images to everyone, but uh, Carol, you do such a great job at at giving the, the overall um, passion that we all have, all three of us behind this project. And you can imagine that it's a project of discovery. And so every time we come across a fabric or a maker, 
you you should see the texts and emails and calls between us. We really just nerd out over these things and we get so excited um, about uh, uh, our discovery, our collections and what we're doing to share those out. So before I jump in to, to kind of do a little bit of a deep dive into what do we do at Around the World, it's great to collect these, but then we don't want to keep them for ourselves and our own particular research, but we want to have the opportunity to share and get hands on fabrics. If you can't get your hands on fabrics to introduce them to you digitally and virtually. So I wanted to share the website that we continue to update and continue to work on and and just like Carol said, all the fabrics that she's mentioned, we still even haven't had half of them up on the website yet. Tierney and I spent about two weeks ago, um, the weekend taking about 154 fabrics and putting them in, archiving them. And we realized that we have about 32 on the website now. So to get a little glimpse into to what we have, to see some of the fabrics that Carol was talking about, and just to to have an just enjoyable time clicking and seeing what you can learn about um, different fabrics that you don't know. This is our digital library for that. And so we're really excited as a part of our outreach program, not only to work on the digital access and library, but also in person um, in person uh, programs that really get these materials into your hand. Uh, I would imagine everyone is in agreement that we all want to touch everything that we're talking about. I need, like, Tierney, we we're so excited about polybion that um, when do I get to touch it, Tierney? I want to feel it. How does it feel? What is your hand? You know, is it tough? Is it, you know, how does a fabric move? Um, so <laughs> good, it crinkles. So we're really excited uh, about this resource uh, that we have. Uh, but I do want to jump over and just give you a, a little bit of a deep dive into to what we just did um, this summer to take all of these fabrics that we've been collecting um, and we're not only collecting the fabrics but we're actually connecting to makers um, if you go on our website what you're going to see um, every every library of excuse me every fabric page if possible we have a connection back to the maker we don't want to be an in-between a go-between we want to be able to um, share their stories and have you have access if you're really interested and want to get a piece of Lotus for yourself. Um, so we're really excited this this year in particular, we really dug deep and developed a lot of outreach programs, um, exhibitions at RISD, exhibitions in Australia um, with um, Raw Assembly. Um, you know, Carol and Tierney were at Biofabricate presenting, um, and every time we would do one of these outreach programs, we would just really see the excitement of everyone that we interacted with about these materials. And then our big project this year, the one that we were so excited about, because it, was, it wasn't just us telling stories, it was us being able to bring people in to not only share the fabrics, but the makers to share their own fabrics. So this is a kind of a bit of a behind the scenes for the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Um, we had fascinating fabrics, interactive programs, um, and we're really excited to take you on a bit of a tour. Um, I hope that you have a chance at some point to go to the Folklife Festival. Um, I know it's been around for decades and it's been a really amazing opportunity to bridge cultures. People are invited from all over the world to come to set up booths outside over a two week period. And so we were there for two full weeks, June, July, and this is our team that were there. Um, so I think you can see how excited we were to be there. And I will kind of go in and, and share um, a little bit more about uh, who people are and what we were able to do while we were there. Our, we, are, uh, we, we like to, to do, you know, if you give us a small tent, we're not just going to put a few fabrics out. We're going to bring like 30 or 40 or 50. Um, I lost count. We want to overdo it. We want people to kind of get in and get so excited about the, the fabrics from our collection to share the stories, not only about, you know, what, what, you know, linen comes from East Africa, no, it's not linen, ooh, excuse me, silk comes from East Africa, but we want to be able to tell, like Tierney said, what is the story behind the materials that we actually wear? So when we went in and decided to set up our booth, we wanted it to be hands-on. We wanted it to be interactive. Uh, we wanted not only just to showcase the fabrics, uh, we wanted to be able to tell about what we currently wear and have people think about 
what it is that they're putting on their bodies and what alternatives that they that are out in the world for them to use. So I'm going to show you just a couple of slides, uh, excuse me, a couple images from how we set up our space. Um, we were really love to have areas where we had bio based textiles together, like Malai out of India that's made out of coconut um, waste uh, from Wigan wool that out of India that Carol mentioned. Um, we had our section of wild silk um, like this from Peace Goods out of Madagascar all the way to hemp um, from Laos and this beautiful image back here, if you can see my mouse, uh, that is a multicolores, um, beautiful uh, rug hooked piece out of t-shirts. And again, we had so many different fabrics out. We were also wanting to make sure, and it gave us heart attacks, uh, all throughout the two weeks because we wanted people to touch them and feel them and make sure that they got their hands on them and understood why we were so excited about the materials. But what really was exciting about our time and our space um, at the Smithsonian was that we were actually able to program our own booth. So we were actually able to go in and invite makers and people that are a part of our community of around the world to come in and share their work. So every day for two weeks straight, we had special guests coming in. We had a kind of a deep dive from Oaxaca to Diana and Jai to Emma Kamano, Acadian Brown Cotton that you heard from a few weeks before, uh, Textile Museum, and then Smithsonian was extraordinarily generous and allowed us to invite um, four artists to come for the second week, two from Mongolia and two from Uganda. So I'll do a little deep dive in a minute into who everybody is. What was great about our space is that we wanted, like Carol said, we have these pillars, recycling, bio-based, animal and plant, and we were able to bring in people every day that represented and shared a little bit more about their own practice in one of these pillars. Um, this is our special friend and colleague um, who we dearly admire. Uh, this is Diana Njai. She's a mixed media textile artist, but is also a curator at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. And so she came in to tell the story of being in Senegal and seeing so many um, of these clothes that were sent from, um, you know, goodwill clothes that were sent over to Senegal, basically washing up on the shore of the beach and really affecting her as an artist. And so she came in to share the story about the importance of mending um, about being thoughtful about our clothes and recycling. Um, and what I wanted to do is pretty much after, after I shared, this is just one of the many uh, fabrics in our collection uh, that, that talks about recycling, that's based in recycling. So you can go on our website and find a little bit more information about this one from Multicolores. Uh, another special guest that we hosted the first week um, and another deep dive was into cotton with uh, Sharon Donnan and Darcy Fabre from Acadian Brown Cotton. And so they came in and brought things from just the, the cotton with the seeds in it all the way to uh, cotton slivers. They were able to share their story on the stage um, about Acadian Brown Cotton and actually did a workshop, a spinning workshop um, for, for guests in the community. So it was really special for us, uh, just like Diana and everyone that week, to be able to not only just show the fabric, but show the behind the scenes and the passion that they have for it. Um, and we really have great memories of sitting at this table for about two hours and everybody, nine or 10 people and the people from the community kept coming up and literally just picking out seeds from cotton and talking. And so this again is, is their work represented on our website and our digital library. Uh, we were able to invite and work with Lori Karchner and Katrina Orsini from the GW Textile Museum. Uh, we wanted to, to focus on silk. And so they came in and brought amazing resources from, from their education collection. Um, they also have Textiles 101 at the museum, at GW Textile Museum. So if you can go and see their work, I think you would be really excited about it. Um, they came in, spread out amazing textiles. Um, they were highlighting an East, uh, excuse me, an Asian uh, textile exhibition that was coming up. Um, and we were able for about two hours to, to have everybody come in and get their hands on it and learn from them. And then it started raining and the bottom dropped out of the sky. And so we were able to only have them for a few hours. 
Uh, we don't have silk from Asia yet, everyone. Uh, but this is some of the silk that we do have in our collection from Madagascar from Tanana. We had uh, to kind of complete our pillar. We went through recycled animal plant. Now we're bio-based. Uh, this wonderful student, Emma Kamano, uh, was able to come with her biomaterials project uh, from RISD. And she was able to do demos on bringing different types of food safe materials together to create touchable, wonderful materials. And so we're really excited to be able to allow students, not allow, but have the opportunity for students like Emma to come in and get excited about the materials to see how her research is a part of this whole story of researchers and makers trying to find really active and very um, important solutions to this, these problems. And so this is again, um, some wonderful work by um, uh, Sasha, Sasha Lauren out of, out of California and her work with uh, kombucha. So our two wonderful guests, we had um, uh, a team from Uganda to come in and bring everything about bark cloth from the ground up. So we didn't just have small fabric samples like we did for the first week, but the second week we were able to really do even more of a deep dive because uh, Fred Alo and Aloysius and Ink Mold and Moogie from Mongolia were there for the entire week. So Fred and Aloysius brought um, bark cloth, finished bark cloth, which is this amazing uh, regenerative material. You can strip a tree and in a year the bark grows back. And it can do this for up to 100 years. It's a 700 year old tradition, very exciting process. And it was really wonderful because uh, Aloysius and Fred were able to figure out how to half process the bark cloth. They were able to pound a little bit in Uganda, bring it to the festival and allow anyone that wanted to from this beautiful, you know, I think she was five year old girl all the way up to anyone of any age to sit down and try their hand at making this cloth. And it was really wonderful to have process and the behind the scenes and people, again, that are the tradition bearers and the ones that are responsible for the cultural preservation of these materials to be there and share their story. Um, again, more on bark cloth uh, on our website. And we had, oh, my favorite, I don't have a favorite. I really don't. Everybody's my favorite. Um, but we really were excited to host Inkbold and Mugi from Mongolia. Uh, this special, special husband and wife team, just like Fred and Aloysius, were able to bring their passion and their materials um, and able to share and able to get everybody's hands in there that wanted to. So as you came by the tent, as you came by our, our section, you were able to, if you wanted to sit and felt, you could sit and felt with camel, yak, horse, wait, we didn't really do horse a lot, camel, yak, horse, goat, and sheep. And we had bags and baskets of it. You can see it at their feet here. What was wonderful as an artist, um, we, we were able to see their work as artists. And you can see behind them is this quilt of five jewels. It's in our Around the World collection. It is a gorgeous example of just the, um, the ability to use these materials in such a wonderful, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing way. Um, and again, more on our website in our digital library. What was special about this and what I think is, is what drives us at Around the World is the ability that we have created relationships with so many people across the globe. And when we have these unique special opportunities to bring people together to meet, and to allow them to collaborate and allow them to get to know each other. Um, just like with this team during the second week, it really makes a wonderful way of cro crossing cultures of, um, you know, Moogie sitting here with Fred and, and deciding to paint on some of the bark cloth. Um, you know, Inkbold and, and um, Aloysius trying each other's techniques out, um, sitting and seeing each of them working and the other's materials. It was a wonderful, wonderful example. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end there because I know we'll probably have some questions. Um, but the one thing that we will continue to work on to get some more um, uh, information out there is, is Inkbold as well was able to bring in uh, his performance piece um, with this really beautiful sculptural gear, um, a yurt. And um, it was a special time 
for us at the festival. Uh, again, starting from not only the material as, as this physical object, but why this material is so important to culture, so important to the ecosystem. And so it was a beautiful performance that he did um, that was highlighting that. Um, the one thing we did, to, uh, and I'll, I'll just add that, that we wanna give people things that they can do to um, enjoy, no, excuse me, we wanna give things people to do their actions they can take now. And so we did do an interactive loom while we were there. So people could tie um, donated fabrics from Queen of Raw, New York. And every time that they were able to tie it on their fabric, weave it in, create a knot, whatever they wanted to do, they would be able to um, check off uh, an action that they could take now. Um, and so these all are action cards that we're able to document and people making decisions to buy less, to think twice. So it was a really wonderful, wonderful opportunity to be at the Smithsonian. Um, and I'm gonna actually have Tierney and Carol jump back on now just to finish out um, and just give you a few things of what we're working on um, for 2023. Some really cool collaborations that came about um, from uh, the Smithsonian, really interesting uh, workshops that we're creating. Uh, this microscopy that Carol mentioned with Tuff Silk Lab, we're constantly adding to our digital, digital library so that all the things that are in our collection are out there for you to see. And we're really excited. We have a list of new materials and new fabrics that we want that is a mile long um, that are really important to fill in the whole story of what is out there globally for us as a snapshot of materials that exist right now. So I will say that there are great ways to get involved uh, as well. Let me see if I can, um, I did this in a way so that if you want to, you can actually hold your phone up and take a little QR snapshot of these. So if you don't mind, I'll leave these up for just a little bit. And you can follow us um, on Instagram right here. You can join our newsletter and sign up for our newsletter. Um, and we also are really, really wanting to grow our collection. Um, and so this is a link that if you're interested, uh, that you can donate a dollar to $500. We use every bit of this that you'll donate to help us procure new materials. And I just put a few down. I'm probably biased. These are on our list and these are the ones that I'm really excited about. Um, but Tierney or Carol, uh, do y'all wanna have any any other closing remarks or the, the fabric that you're ready to get in next on our procurement list? <laughs> y'all are both muted, by the way. We do have quite a few questions, Leslie and I'm Tierney done. and Carol. So, okay, <laughs> just being mindful of the time. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So I did I did bring a piece of um, polybion, which is made from the feedstock is um, is fruit based and um, and it's and you take microbes that ferment based on that feedstock and they cr they crank out a cellulostic material that's made into a vegan leather that doesn't have polyurethane in it. So that's a, a really, really interesting up and coming startup out of Mexico. So we're we're quite interested in in marrying the old and the new and and um, finding eco friendly ways using technology, but also being very cognizant um, of of traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. So finding that happy balance. Let me ask a question while we're here. Um, someone wanted to know about the sustainability of man-made natural fiber products like bamboo, viscose, rayon, tencel. Um, I know you talked about four pillars, but I didn't get my notes down about what those all were. So if maybe one of you would sort of say that part again, and then talk about, I guess these yeah. man-made fibers are your bio-based fabrics, is that right? No, well, the, those kind of fall into a, into a, a category of processed um they're they're still synthetic in that they need to be put into slurries and there's a lot of processing go that goes into the rayon viscose tencel category of fibers um <clears throat> our four pillars are plant animal biofabricated and then recycled upcycled so the viscose is kind of in that 
um, it's in the processed biofabrication umbrella. Um, it varies dramatically in terms of the eco footprint of those various that that particular category that's rayon ask even though it's derived from plants the amount of processing and chemical um chemical inputs um and energy requirements are are huge depending on what you're looking at standard rayon is is really awful Tencel is better. Um, they have different feedstocks. Some have eucalyptus, some have beech, some have, um, you know, uh, just uh, agricultural waste. So there's lots of different, different areas. The one company I will say that's doing a lot of work in this and trying to do as, as eco-friendly as possible is lensing. Um, and so, so Would we you do say that again, Tierney? I didn't get it. Lensing, L-E-N-Z-I-N-G. L-E-N-Z-I-N. Z-I-N-G, lensing. I, I can put it in the, um, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, good. Um, so that that's the company that's really, um, really working at trying to clean up the, that, that whole area. And they have some of the large, largest scale production of, of um, tensile, which is one of the, one of the better of those in terms of it, the chemicals used, the feedstock and the energy usage. But we do we did an Instagram posting that identified and defined all those different categories because it gets really complicated. You've got yeah. modal, you've got viscose, you've got tinsel, you've got, you know, rayon. So so um I can maybe we can pull up the the link to that Instagram posting where we go we get down in the weeds. That would be helpful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. On along the same lines, some same person asked, are any natural fabrics waterproof? Yeah, I answered that in the chat, but um, there's vent ventile, um, which is a, a very tightly, tightly woven cotton um, with super long staple. Um, and um, and actually, this was the same company that outfitted Edmund Hillary to climb Everest. Yeah. So it's been it's been um it's been around for a while, and um and they use this the similar technique. But but Ventil has um they won top awards at the Performance Fabric Fair, which happened in Munich last year. I think Performance Fabric. I, I don't know if it always happens in Germany. I think it may go to different locations, but they won won one of the top awards in this sustainability category ventile v-e-n-t-i-l-e i can put that in the chat too yeah that would be great um here's a sort of a good a future type question uh, do you think these ideas uh that people are exploring will be slow to take you know to take on are people in general open to this what was your experience at the smithsonian show uh, do, which do you guys um i mean like the with the public yeah <laughs> the public the public is open and excited about this as far as we can tell um when you look at the vegan leather market vegan leather market it's being driven by consumer demand and it's slated to be a 90 billion dollar market by 2025 so uh, people want this that it's coming on the radar in terms of um, the the footprint that fashion is having. I mean, I think every other day I'm reading something in the New York Times that's, that's talking about how egregious um, the fashion industry is when it comes to environmental problems and issues. Um, so this is certainly on the radar. There is larger and larger consumer demand. So I think I think we're going to see a lot more people. Um, embracing alternatives and hopefully having patience when it comes to new materials because you know it took 60 years to develop lycra 60 years now lycra we're not big fans of lycra because it's a petroleum-based product but i use that as an example to say that coming de designing a material that can fulfill all the needs that you want it is a is a lengthy iterative process so we're still in the early stages. We can do things a lot faster nowadays because we have 
synthetic biology and we can crank things out. We're more knowledgeable, but it's still a process. So these new leathers and like fabrics made from mycelium, they're not going to be like stuff you're used to. <laughs> you know, they, they, they're going to have some special properties that maybe won't be so great. They might smell a little funky, but we're, you know, I, I, I really encourage people to be, to be patient and um, encouraging as opposed to just saying, you know, damning, you know, right. give, well, give the industry a chance. I guess but, that begs the question of where's the experimentation happening? Is it, is it R and D in industry? Is it in university labs? Is it in the field? I mean, where, who are the people who are developing these new processes? All of the above all of yeah. the above, all over every corner of the globe. And if people are interested, I, I urge you to just, um, I'm gonna put this in the chat, um, to just Google the word biofabricate. And there's a biofabricate group in Brooklyn run by Suzanne Lee, who is on our board of directors, full disclosure, and is a completely brilliant goddess in the field. <laughs> is really, really leading the field. Yay, another woman um, leading the field in in um, in brilliance and in helping define what the field is and criteria, um, certification. So, so biofabricate, Suzanne Lee, and you'll, oh, there's a wormhole there for you to dive into. Okay. Judy, I just want to share one quick thing, which I, at least for me as an anthropologist is just so interesting and fascinating and exciting. Um, you know, I'm used to working with communities, women groups, last 30 years in the Himalayas. That's been my life and in Mongolia. But what's so fascinating is by going to these biofabrication conferences, you're starting to see how we humans have a really ancient relationship to microbes. You think about it. What beer and wine and bread, you know, we're like old witches. We could, we'd watch the bubble. We didn't know what was actually going on, but we knew something was happening. So it was almost like they're a companion species. So what is so exciting today is, is what's happening is we are as, as species starting to understand as we can understand microbes better, this may help us to survive into the future. And so it's understanding these very, you know, what are, what are we humans made of? 90% of us are microbes. So I, I find it something very, very exciting as we think how scary we've just come out of a pandemic and how we, what we think as humans normally we've thought, you know, these are dangerous, this is scary. And it, they, yeah, it can, it can kill us if we don't understand it. So as we're learning more and as our knowledge is growing, how we can understand and work with these, with microbes to create our future. It's really something quite profound, in my opinion. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. Very, you guys are all very enthusiastic. You know, get makes me want to get up and go, hooray. <laughs> so that's appreciated. <laughs> now, now, let me pose, um, I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse or not, but one of our um, listeners today, watchers said there's a province in Pakistan that had flooding in August which decimated their cotton crops and wanted to know how could their livelihood be restored I don't I don't know that there's more to do except for wait till next year but maybe there is Tierney um well so with Pakistan I, I mean I, I know that the, there's such such a rich textile tradition in Pakistan and has been so slammed with natural disasters. And I will say that this is something that's not just um, specific to Pakistan. We're having in Kenya, there's a massive drought that's happening um, due to climate change that's altering their livelihood and their relationship with their cattle and <laughs> um, nothing to eat. And and so then that's ca causing problems with, with um, elephants. And so and more poaching. So, so this thing that's happening in Pakistan is is emblematic of our world and the challenges that we will be facing as the climate changes. Um, that said, every one of the countries that we've worked with and indigenous groups that we've worked with, we find local groups that are that are trying to um, 
restore their habitats. And so I think that the the way that we can best rise to the challenge of our increased climate challenges, the climate impacts is by making sure we have our biodiversity of our ecosystems intact. That gives us the resilience to then deal with such extreme extreme conditions. So what we're hoping, um, I can't point to one any one particular group in Pakistan, um, but what I can say is that we are we are excited and hopeful because we every every group that we work with, um, we see how we can connect them to groups that are helping to connect to the natural world and restore biodiversity, which restores resilience in the ecosystem, which gives communities the ability to adapt to our fast changing world. So I hope that's, I mean, it's a little bit of a, a, a roundabout way of saying, um, so I can't answer it with specifically with Pakistan, but I hope that gives the, the conceptual framework in which we're working, which is by connecting us back to the natural world and rebuilding the productivity and resilience of ecosystems is going to be our only way forward um, in, in, in the face of climate change. Okay, um, one more question is, where do you get your funding? And I suppose well, that's from all <laughs> different places, but why don't you give us some examples of, for each of you, for the work that you do, where do you get your funding? We're, well, we, go, ahead. go ahead, Carol. Okay. Um, you know, here's, I'll tell you guys the secret. Um, Tierney is a very dynamic, extraordinary, beloved human being. And um, through her extraordinary hard work um, as a marine biologist and her dedication, um, I think it, it was, it's been recognized by an, an individual donor who is a huge fan. And he, ha he believes uh, in the project and he believes uh, that we're really going to try, we're going to make a difference. And um, so right now, that is one of our, our, our first seed donor. And now we're looking really to try to not just do this all ourselves. You know, I, 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 am, I am quite confident that in this group, there are extraordinary people who know a lot more things about aspects of textiles than either Tierney or Leslie or myself. I mean, personally, I believe the future is not heroes. It's the we, not an I, is how we're going to, you know, have an impact and change the world. And women, we, for 20,000 years, textiles has really been, um, it's been women's work. So I would really hope that we can try to change and transform things uh, through connection and collaboration with other women. So where have our funding in the past has come gotten our initial seed money from one person and now we hope to spread it out to others. Is there, is there anything else, Tierney or Leslie, you guys would like to add to that? Um, you know, I, we're, we're looking forward to doing more interactive programming. We really felt like having that opportunity to be at the Smithsonian, um, RISD, and all the ways that we can interact with the community is, it really gets our message out there and it really is, is a multiplier effect. And so we are also um, looking for um, and writing grants actually too for programs. Um, we're also looking at really unique opportunities to bring people together that are in our, our collection, right? The makers in our collection together um, on projects that could really make an impact um, in the research and, and on the ground work um, with communities. And so again, um, we're gonna be focused on, on um, looking at programming and finding funding for, for that way of getting out there. Um, and like Carol said, it's all, we are collaborators. Um, you can't get three people like us together without a, a whole focus on collaboration. I mean, a marine biologist, a textile artist, and a, and a medical anthropologist all on one project. Um, <laughs> and it works so well. And so we take that idea of collaboration forward. So if there are institutions um, that would love to bring the around the world there to develop any specific programs or workshops. We have an amazing amount in, of information and, and beautiful people and ways that we can take that and build some wonderful and effective programs. 
Well, with that, Leslie, great way to wrap up. Um, I know there are more questions. When you receive your copy, uh, your link to the video program next week, probably Kelsey, right? We'll um, have contact information there for you as well. And I encourage you to continue to think about other kind of fabrics that might be good for their collection and see what we can do to help grow it. So thank, thank you, so, you so much for being with us today. This was a fascinating program. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys. So exciting so <laughs> to, to see everybody and, and have a wonderful weekend.